want is answered by the apostle when he says in verse 2, God forbid. No, that's not true. Now you may notice the King James translation here of the Holy Scripture, the phrase God forbid, and I want to make a quick parenthesis so that I'll understand something about translation. It's just a good time to bring it up. No original manuscript or copy has the word God or the word forbid in the text here. Neither one of those. This is what we call a dynamic translation, meaning the translators translated the concept rather than the word for words of what it says in the original languages. Let me explain that for you just really quickly. Uh, in the Koine Greek, there is a phrase that is used to refer to, it's an idiom that refers to the absolute certainty of something. Another way to put it is, let this never come from your mouth. The words in the Greek are megunoito, not God or forbid. And it basically means the strongest way the Greeks could say, don't let this be uttered. Don't say this. May it never be. Certainly not. No, in no way. Now, the reason I don't believe this is a bad translation of that, even though it's not word for word, because I think what happened, I don't know what the King James translators were doing. I'm not in their brains. I believe what they were doing is finding a 17th century phrase that would reflect the strength of this. And the way they understood it was the idea of, God forbid that you should ever say this. The idea there is, so I, I just don't want, I want you to understand, I want to be very honest with the text of Scripture and show what it actually is saying here. But I want us to understand the concept of however this is translated, and by the way, God forbid, I think is a valid translation, I think may it never be, I think certainly not, no way, I think those are all valid translations promoting this concept of what the idiom is teaching, and that is this. What are you thinking? <laughs> Now, that may not be the best translation of it. But that's really the concept of this idiom. The concept is, get that out of your heads. Don't even entertain that thought. It's as strong as you can say is the concept here. That teaches me something about this question. The concept that I can live a licentious life or I have license to sin because of grace is something that should not even come into my brain. I shouldn't even consider that. I shouldn't say, well, you know, he has a point. No, don't even, may this never be spoken. Don't say that. And that is the strength of what he is trying to describe there. Now, the opposite of that, the legalistic living we talked about last week, the grace denial, some Christians, well-intentioned, and some not so well-intentioned, will spring, for, spring from this pendulum too far in the other direction and will suggest or even outright say that we are saved by grace, but we have to maintain God's favor on our lives and God's delight in us by obeying His commands. The first extreme has God as the cool guy, ready to give out high fives and wink at sin. The other extreme has God as the ultra strict father, watching over his children, ready to swat them at the first sign of sinful behavior. These are two extremes. We don't want to live in the extremes, right? We don't want to be off on the left hand or the right hand. We want to be on. We want to be right with God, right with the Word, right with Christ. This latter category was the Pharisees. They were the legalists of their day. In fact, they were so afraid of people disobeying God's laws, and they were so afraid of the concept of grace, that they made up laws more strict than God's, so that people would not even come close to sinning. Literally, I mean, literally, they, they said this. In fact, in the Mishnah, which is the oldest of the Talmud, this is what they say. This is a quote from the Mishnah. The Ethics of the Fathers, 1-1, one, one, in case you want to look it up in your Talmud sometime. <laughs> I don't even have a Talmud. I don't know where to get one. This is what they say, though. Be deliberate in judgment. Raise up disciples and make a fence around the Torah. You know what they meant by make a fence around the Torah? Was to add to God's commands so that no one would even come close to breaking God's laws. Friends, I am sure that there are many Christians who actually agree with the Jews in this category, the Pharisees. Well, we need to err on the side of caution to make fences around God's laws so we don't break them. The problem is, Jesus condemned this. Take your Bibles. We're going to come back to Romans 6, but take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 15. We are going to get back to Romans 6, but I want to expound, as I said I was going to, on this concept of legalism and obedience. Are they mutually exclusive? I mean, 
If you obey, are you a legalist? Or if you're a legalist, does that mean you obey? We need to understand this. Matthew chapter 15, verse 3, But he answered and said unto them, he's talking to the elders, the Pharisees, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. It's the stoning death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah the prophesy of you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That's the concept that they, they held to. Making a fence around the Torah. Teaching for doctrines that which is God's, the commandments of men. They made the commandments of men out to be on an equal plane with the commandments of God. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did. That is why they were upset that Jesus and his disciples did not wash their hands ceremonially before they ate. See, that wasn't in God's law. But they figured that way you could be ceremonially clean before you ate. That way, in case there was any sin you didn't know about, it'd be washed away. See, God never told them to do that. But they added a commandment of men, a tradition, in order to be certain you wouldn't sin. They elevated their standards and their rules to the place of God's law. And Jesus himself condemns them for that. That is a dangerous thing. Now, we actually find out later, Jesus will say that it's not wrong to actually keep what the scribes say. You see, the problem was not that it's bad to wash your hands ceremonially before you ate. The problem was that they had elevated that to the same par as God's law. And that's where we're going to get into this concept of differentiating between legalism and obedience. It's not a sin to have a different application of biblical principles. It is not wrong to have standards, guardrails, to keep us from sin. But it is wrong to make violation of those guardrails the same thing as sin. That is the difference. It is not sin to have a less strict standard or rule than another brother either. It is not sin. In these passages, we see Jesus' displeasure with the legalistic Pharisees because they had elevated their traditions, their fences, their guardrails to the same authority as God's revealed word. And God never said so many things the Pharisees viewed as right and obedient. <laughs> they made lots of them up. By adding to God's commands, they had done just as much damage as those who with license had disobeyed God's command. Isn't that what he said? He said they made the commandment of God of none effect. He said, you're doing the same thing as those with license. You're pulling the attention away from God and putting it on you. Same problem, different way of getting there. So, the legalist denies grace, or at least devalues grace, by suggesting that our works or our effort will attain or maintain holiness or the righteousness of God. In fact, we need to completely remove the concept of comparing holiness and righteousness based on external experiences anyways. Based on external appearance. Okay, first because comparison of people one to another is forbidden by God himself and it's called foolish in 2 Corinthians 10, 12. They that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. And so if in your heart and your mind you have a tendency to say, well, so-and-so must not be a spiritual because just look at them. Whether or not they are is not even the question. The problem is you're foolish for trying to compare yourself to them. Let's get that right off the bat. Secondly, the only standard of we have of holiness is God's character. That's what ought to be our standard of holiness. And God's character is revealed to us in the Word of God. We are only considered holy by God because of Jesus Christ's holiness. Jesus Christ's holiness, do you understand? Christ's holiness obstructs the view of God from us. Meaning when God sees us, he can't see me. He sees Jesus Christ's holiness instead of mine. Therefore, me trying to exalt and emphasize my holiness is futile. 
It's all because of Jesus Christ's holiness that God views me as righteous and holy before him. Sure, man looks on the outward appearance. But that's only because man is weak. Man is inept. That's all man can see. It doesn't mean it's good. And that's what Jesus sought to expose about the Pharisees. The constant attention to the external by the Pharisees is what Jesus detested so much. That's why in uh, Matthew 15, verse 10, he goes on and says, And he called the multitude and said to them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth that defileth a man. He's saying, listen, it's what's inside that is defiling or not. So we're not to live with license towards sin, and we're not to live as legalists, exalting rules and standards to the place of attaining or maintaining righteousness and holiness. So then, how are we supposed to live? What is the balance here? We're going to get to that in more detail. Actually, throughout the book of Romans 6 and 7, he'll describe this and give marks of Christian living, marks of sanctification throughout Romans chapter 6. So we won't get to that all this morning, obviously. And we'll get to a little bit more about this in just a moment. But just as a little preemptive statement before we back up a little bit. How are we to live? We are to live by faith, walking in humble obedience to the word of God with proper interpretation of God's commands. That's how we're to live. That is not licensed to sin. And that is not licensed to be legalistic and rule-based in our thinking either. We'll get to that in just a moment, but I want to deviate for just a little bit to show some marks of legalism from the Scripture and show the distinguishing marks between those who is walking in a legalistic manner and someone who is walking in obedience. Why do I need to believe it's important for us to look at this? Because sometimes they'll look the same. Sometimes someone who living a legalistic way of living will look like someone who's walking obediently. Why? Because it's the same commands, right? Well, some of the same commands. So, sometimes a person can be obeying God's command, but can be doing it with a legalistic mindset. And so it is important to distinguish between the two, because you cannot say, and, and this, is, this is disturbing to me how this is said sometimes, if a Christian has a certain way of living that they believe is proper according to the Word of God, and someone doesn't like it, and they say, you're just a legalist. That's not fair. Okay? Because legalism implies the same thing about the Pharisees. It implies an intent of the heart. So sometimes it might look similar. An obedient Christian and a legalistic Christian might look alike on the outside. So it's important to understand the identifying or distinguishing marks between the two. So maybe a way to put it, and I think we ought to be teachable, right? So we ought to ask the question, am I a legalist? I think it's very clear we can know not to be licentious, right? Not to live sinful lives. But am I a legalist? Why am I doing this? We need to ask that question. I think every Christian should be willing to ask that. And if you get defensive about asking that, well, maybe I'd ask it a little more. Defensive, defensive nature indicates, well, it's like the words of Shakespeare. Methinks they doth protest too much. <laughs> okay? But be honest. Now, first, let me say the mark of a legalist is not one who makes applications to scriptural principles and seeks to obey those applications. Because someone seeks to obey the scripture does not make them a legalist. Nor is a legalist necessarily one who has standards for operating within the Christian life. Could be, but not necessarily. Also, it should be assumed that a person who is a legalist, it should not be assumed that a person is a legalist because they've refused to participate in certain activities or behaviors. But a word of warning. If you have a strict standard about dress, food, media, or other applications of biblical principles, and you don't want to be called a legalist because of your strict standards, there are strong standards that you have, then don't view those who don't have your standard about dress, food, and media as liberal or licentious. Okay? Kind of turnabout's fair play, right? If you're not a legalist for having certain standards, then that doesn't necessarily mean they're disobedient for not having certain standards. Right? We have to understand, we can't just lump people into categories. Don't compare yourself with others, Corinthians tells us. But I hope you notice, a person is not legalistic today because they do or don't do certain things. 
the fundamental mark of legalism that each person needs to view concerning themselves is about